now to the main event. I am absolutely delighted to welcome Kate Antifield to the uh, BLSI. Uh, it's been, uh, we've met actually in the park in, in Sydney Gardens. So I think it was great that she offered to, to do a presentation. And actually uh, by doing some research into Kate, we actually have more in common than I thought. We both went to Leeds University. I went first, uh, Kate a bit later on. Kate studied uh, politics, I studied economics. Uh, Kate then went on to Selhurst University in London to get her MA in politics and history, and then uh, went to Cranford School of Management uh, for business growth and business growth program. I also went to Cranford School of Management uh, again, independently, we'd never met, uh, to do a strategic, uh, a strategic uh, consultancy course. So, but then the, our paths definitely uh, diverged and, and Kate went on and uh, uh, has done wonderful things since, uh, including appearing in the bottom line program on Radio 4, giving insights in terms of how consumer trends uh, are changing as a result of the pandemic. She's also part of part time on the Vita forum, but her main job, her day job is the CEO or founder of GDR, the creative intelligence agency doing agency and strategic and retail aspects. And I'm, I'm, I'm blown away by the client list that I've seen there in terms of Tesco, Microsoft, Coca-Cola, Procter and & Gamble, and, and the list goes on. So I think it's a, a great pleasure. Uh, I would like you to put your hands together and welcome our resident futurologist for tonight, Kate Antico. Over to you. <laughs> my academic twin. <laughs> Who knew that our lives have been so parallel? Thank you all of you uh, and you, you at home for attending on such a sweltering evening. So I'm going to try and keep this sort of pace quite clippy, um, but you know, it is quite dense. So, you know, put your hand up if there's anything really not clear that we can't go on without the building block being laid as foundation. Before we start, uh, and I will obviously share my screen and press play, uh, which will help. Can I just have a, a show of hands? How many people here are, you know, somewhat at least or relatively uh, familiar with the whole idea of the metaverse? Oh, pretty much everyone. So you're an advanced team of people. Excellent. How many people are familiar with NFTs? Yes, pretty much the same amount. So all good. Right, we're going to jump straight in then. No beginners <laughs> stuff here. So GDR, thank you, Andreas, for the intro. We like to think of ourselves these days as wayfinders to the future of predominantly retail brand and experience. And as Andreas very kindly mentioned, uh, we are retained by uh, pretty much the world's biggest consumer brands. Um, and I personally work with about 30 of them at any one time. And we, we, not necessarily we in this room, but uh, the people of this time, I think, are the last generation to draw any distinction between online and offline. This is that famous quote by the novelist uh, William Gibson. I do think it's relevant. It feels jarring, I think, to a person uh, such as myself from Gen X, but I think it feels completely natural to uh, younger generations. So we at GDR, who do study these things quite intensely, um, with the help of an artificial intelligence trend tracking tool, um, so it's a team of very senior people and an AI um, that ascertains these trajectories of uh, future trends, we believe that the new digital age uh, is converging at scale, partly because of COVID, not surprisingly. Um, but, you know, essentially, if you are a big brand, a large corporation, it is not really uh, the done thing anymore <laughs> to consider um, the physical and the digital to be totally separate worlds. They are converging, um, in, certainly in terms of marketing. Now, I know you don't need this, but in case there's anyone at home that uh, needs a bit of a catch up, <laughs> nobody in this room does. Uh, the, the metaverse doesn't actually exist. 
as a singular thing? As you know, there are many metaverses, or is it metaverse I? No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know it's metaverses. Um, they are not interoperable. We're at the very early stages. Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> thinks this is a 10 year program. <clears throat> and obviously he hopes that his one will win through, but many others hope that a more decentralized uh, set of interoperable metaverses will be the future. But essentially they are persistent shared virtual worlds they must have their own currency to be a metaverse. Um, so they usually have some element of their own economy um, and you can buy and sell things in them like land, clothes, um, aspects of your avatar, names, uh, intellectual property, art in the form of NFTs, etc. They are typically based on blockchain technology and they are not just games or worlds, they are also work environments um, like, for example, uh, Facebook's Horizon Workrooms or Microsoft Mesh, places where people meet each other to engage in office -y type work, <laughs> not just, uh, you know, playing kind of Dungeons and Dragons type games, although of course there is that as well. So you might be wondering, hmm, okay, I did know that, but I wasn't completely sure why that is different, this modern metaverse that everyone's only talking about in the last six months or so, it seems. What's the difference between that and the sort of 18 year ago second life type metaverse or the Sims that's been around for a long time? Well, we think that essentially the differences are that the current metaverses are best experienced in three dimensions using a virtual reality headset, typically about two or 300 quid. Um, they are also places where you can create and sell your own IP and buy some things for a certain amount of in-game currency and sell them for more currency. So you can speculate. So it is a place for people to not just consume, but also produce, speculate, create, be something uh, that you are not in the normal world. Um, and also, of course, it's based on the blockchain. So the Sims or Second Life were not based on the blockchain. And part of that's relevant because nobody owns the blockchain. Um, you can't have a singular owner of something which is based on a blockchain. Everybody owns what they own for themselves. So that's why they consider these space spaces to be somewhat or entirely decentralized. And there typically is a much greater bridge or potential bridge between modern day metaverses and the real world through things like virtual reality, augmented reality, People now have real jobs earning real money that they use to live on by working as an avatar, for example, in a casino or a shop in the metaverse. And we'll come to that later. We'll, we'll see some examples of that. But for those of you who are perhaps not yourselves gamers, although I'm sure many of you are, um, this gives you an idea of the kinds of meta metaverses uh, that I'm talking about here. There are the virtual worlds, which tend to be fully decentralized, Somnium Space, created by the famous Winklevoss brothers, uh, who had the big fight with uh, Mark Zuckerberg, crypto voxels, Decentraland. Um, but the big numbers come with the games like Fortnite, 350 million players. Could easily be three or four million players playing at the same time globally at busy times in the holidays, for example. Roblox, 164 million players, could be 42, uh, 43 million daily players. Um, so, you know, these are very big numbers and it's very expensive if brands want to partner in those big games. So when Travis Scott, the rapper, did a live concert in Roblox, uh, they replayed it four times, they had 28 million unique viewers. They had 12 million live on the first show. The song that he released in Roblox, uh, in that live show, 
became number one immediately in America. So there's big money to be made, real people attending in enormous numbers within these games. But of course, we've also got the enterprise metaverse. The numbers are so low, we don't even have numbers for them yet because they are very new. They've only launched in the last year or so. So <clears throat> you might be thinking, well, I don't know anyone that spends a lot of time in the metaverse. Really, do I need to know about it? Um, it? This may not be about you, but it is about uh, Gen Z and Alpha because they will make up 50% of the world's population by 2030. So that's not far away, obviously only eight years, according to the UN. And just to have a look at how different those Gen Z and Alphas are, perhaps from, well, my generation, for example, um, and don't forget, 80% of Gen Z and millennials are gamers. I mean, pretty much almost all of them. Uh, they, of course, have been at first from the beginning. 97% um, of them say that uh, social media is their main source of inspiration for, you know, finding brands, following celebrities, buying things, etc. cetera. Um, they already spend the GDP of Iceland, the, the country, not the shop, uh, <laughs> on TikTok in China in 2021. Um, and they, of course, expect instant gratification in a way that perhaps previous generations don't. You know, retailers these days think they've done amazingly well with a two hour delivery window. Young people expect 10 minutes. And if I could also see a show of hands, how many people here have shopped and bought something uh, using augmented reality? Right, so nobody here, and that is totally normal <laughs> for an audience of grown-ups. I normally in 250 or 300 people get maybe three people who have. Well, that just shows how different the generations are because 30% of Gen Z have made a purchase using augmented reality, looking through their phone, seeing a layer like Ikea's place, where you see a sofa in your room, you can size it, change the color, and then you press buy. That's fine with augmented reality. So they are big on that. And also with VR, they are very interested in VR. They are a quarter of them saying that they would spend up to $200 on virtual items. Now you might think, well, why do you need a virtual item? <laughs> well, it's to dress your avatar so that your avatar looks good in a virtual world because you're wearing a VR headset and you're seeing everything in three dimensions and it feels real to you. So of course you want your avatar to represent you as a unique individual. So in uh, South Korea, this chap, Andrew Koo, who's one of our experts that we interviewed, um, founded a um, fashion metaverse called Ada. And he says that in his part of the world, bear in mind, South Korea is the leader in the metaverse because people who have been forced out of China, because China does not allow any of this sort of thing to go on, they've been forced out of China and gone to South Korea in many cases. In his world of, no doubt, young, tech forward, uh, middle class people, they are now spending more money uh, buying virtual goods and NFTs than they are buying real clothes in e-commerce. Now, I'm not saying that's correct for everyone all over the world, but that's what he says for his part of the world. Just to break a few myths, um, it's not just all young chaps uh, in their bedrooms gaming. Uh, it's 46% of uh, gamers are female. Uh, which may surprise some of you. And there are, but there are differences between games. So, you know, Fortnite is predominantly male, uh, whereas Animal Crossing is predominantly female. Um, female gamers, however, are the fastest growing audience in the industry. And we see that esports uh, viewership is expanding. We're now starting to see department stores of the future opening up, like Wow Madrid, for example, in Spain with e-gaming facilities in the physical shop, essentially, because people want to be together even when they're e-gaming. And it's not just the young, there is a uh, Lenovo sponsored crack team called the Silver Snipers, 
of professional gamers um, who obviously go around the world, they're in their 60s and above, uh, winning tournaments in e-commerce. And it's not just GDR saying this, um, Gartner, obviously a well-respected research company, is quoted as saying that a quarter of the population by 2026 will spend at least an hour a day in the metaverse for work, education, play, social, entertainment, leisure. So that's not just young people, they're pretty much, I think, saying everybody. Um, so I think if we're in education, we need to start paying attention to this, as well as if we're in bars, restaurants, retail, uh, uh, commerce, etc. And we are seeing, with our research, uh, the metaverse weaving its way into almost everything, both consumer facing, if you're a big brand, and back office. Now, this is a big brand thing at the moment, I, I hasten to add. Uh, of course, small businesses uh, are quite right to sit back and observe, learn, and be in information gathering mode. Uh, let the Coca-Colas, obviously, and the P&Gs lead the way, because we are absolutely at the foothills of all of this, I hasten to add. I'm not suggesting any of you <laughs> spend tens of thousands uh, or more jumping into the metaverse and buying land right now. But I think we're at the stage where it's certainly interesting enough for most people in commerce to at least need to know about it. So I've turned off all the sound because it was a bit annoying with the uh, setup, but I'm just gonna talk over a few videos here, but this is a Japanese mall, but so there's gonna be a little bit of movement and video, but no sound, but it just gives you an idea of what some of these spaces look like. So this is a multi retailer mall with 300 stores at the moment, and typically about 300,000 uh, unique visitors in 2021. So why Japanese young people like this kind of thing is that uh, they're using their creativity to create their avatar, they're meeting their friends within these retail spaces, and they're buying digital assets for their avatars to wear. And in some cases, they might be going into the Disney store, for example, and buying physical assets might be a toy or something like that, that is then mailed to their real home address. So there is interaction between the real world as well. But we see some very grown up brands like CVS, which is like Boots, um, CVS in the US, a pharmacy and healthcare provider that is now starting to trademark its name in the metaverse or various metaverses um, in order to prepare for providing future pharmacy health advisory services, um, as well as the sale of virtual goods and NFTs. And you might be thinking, why would a pharmacy sell me an NFT? Because they're typically considered to be digital artworks at the moment. Uh, we'll see later on how you can be using NFTs for many more things than just art. Um, they are in use for subscription, for loyalty, for membership, for all sorts. And we have things like um, insurance companies using um, the metaverse to essentially onboard new staff. So you're sitting at home, you've just joined this insurance company, you've got your Oculus headset on, which they've probably given you, um, and you are in three dimensions, perhaps in a virtual office on the virtual campus, perhaps having real conversations with the CEO that you wouldn't perhaps otherwise have uh, while you're learning how to do your job. And this is what these kinds of enterprise metaverse look like. This is Meta, formerly Facebook's uh, Horizon Workrooms. It's quite typical for these avatars to be legless, <laughs> top off only. And you can see that when you're there in those spaces, you're chatting to your colleagues, um, the artificial intelligence is uh, monitoring the intonations of your voice. And when your voice goes up, your little avatar eyebrows go up automatically. You do not have to press an eyebrow up button. So the faces move alongside natural movement based on artificial intelligence interpreting your voice. You can also press buttons for hands up and that kind of thing. But as you can see, if you're attending a work meeting in the form of a cartoon avatar that looks like you, you can 
very quickly see that you would spend extra money, okay, micro amounts, to get that look right, the right hair, the right hair, eye color, the right outfits to represent your online persona. And in places like Japan, we see um, HR companies uh, starting to uh, recruit employees with metaverse experience and to hire people and train people who are used to working in the metaverse in the form of an avatar to perhaps greet customers, to work in shops. Uh, this is a virtual electronic store in Japan called Beta. Uh, it used to be a physical store in America, sadly no longer, but does now exist. And as you can see, you visit the store in the form of your avatar, and you might chat to store associates in the form of their avatar, and you talk to them either with your uh, actual voice using the microphone, or you might text them, and they would be helping you in the normal way. So of course, these people are earning real wages. Uh, usually being paid in the in-game currency, which in many cases they can now exchange for the likes of dollars um, and obviously have real use of real cash in the real world. And again, back to South Korea, which I mentioned is uh, pretty advanced in this area. They are in a sort of three to five year program of creating a metaverse digital twin of the city of Incheon, which will be there kind of municipal body, like the town council. So not only will it replicate the physicality of the physical city or the roads, the waterways, the gas works, everything, which will allow, for example, their fire departments to um, scenario plan for things like flooding and how they should deal with that. But they will also provide um, replicas of visitor attractions for tourists to attend, even from their own countries, or for the citizens of Incheon to have meetings with the bureaucrats in the city to talk about the collection of their bins, etc. So we start to see municipal and governance applications for virtual worlds in the metaverse that have real uh, solid, useful applications, uh, not just for commerce, but also for citizenship. And of course, Microsoft, <laughs> alongside Meta and Google, they're all uh, very much into developing their um, capabilities within uh, the metaverse and their, um, you know, their infrastructure stack, as uh, Satya Nadella from Microsoft calls it, because you know, many of us are going to be working in the metaverse in many uh, various ways. And certainly for marketeers, this is a very hot topic, despite the fact that we have obviously had a huge crash recently, which we shouldn't ignore. There's been a massive cryptocurrency crash and a decline in value of NFTs recently. However, um, people I think are still in uh, information gathering mode Nobody is yet sure whether this is going to be the next uh, form of internet. And in 10 years time, we will look back and laugh at people who said, the internet, you know, 20 years ago, the internet, that'll never take off. Nobody quite wants to be that person now in talking that way about the metaverse. Uh, but also no one is yet sure whether it will become the new uh, third way of interacting online in a much more experiential three-dimensional way. Nobody knows. <laughs> but if you were putting any marketing budget to this at all yet, um, then we would advise that if you are going to do that, you would consider um, opportunities which link the metaverse with the physical world. That's a safer bet at this early stage. So for example, I'll show you some uh, places where people are earning real money, or at least, um, you know, it's looking as though it's moving in the dir that direction. Samsung uh, created uh, their physical um, flagship space, which they call the 837 shop. They've got one in uh, New York, in Decentraland. So one of those decentralized metaverse worlds. 
And it looked, you know, a bit like this, you know, you could attend um, possibly, you know, with friends, uh, you would see real kind of employees giving speeches and so on. And <clears throat> it was all very entertaining. It must have been because 100,000 people, they claim, attended this launch. Now, bear in mind only 800,000 people are using Decentraland. <laughs> That's a pretty high hit rate. And I suspect the reason why people may have been doing that um, is because with one click of a button, you could go through to the website of Samsung and get a code for a pre-order of this new phone that they were launching. Now, don't forget, people who get, you know, desirable tech early are often doing it with an eye to the secondary market. So there's often a, a money-making um, opportunity here for people who know how to get first in line uh, in the metaverse. We see pop-ups, for example, as you do in the real world, you see pop-ups in the metaverse world. This is Tiger Beer in Malaysia, and this was a one month a, um, street food festival within a Malaysian metaverse. And as you can see, your avatar would walk down the virtual street and you could order real food that would arrive within a couple of hours at your real address. So this is your Google Eats, but ordered from a three-dimensional experiential place. And you may have heard of the um, Bored Ape Yacht Club. How many people here have heard of Bored Ape Yacht Club? <laughs> so not so many actually, uh, two or three. Um, they are a series of 10,000 is the typical number of uh, a drop of NFTs, 10,000 board apes uh, that a computer has made a slightly different version for each of those 10,000 digital artworks. And each is unique and each is sold on the NFT uh, marketplace. And in this case, they have become the hot property in the art world. And they are typically valued at about uh, $250,000. And all the top celebrities in America are showing off the fact, about the fact they have a board ape in a striped t shirt or a board ape smoking a pipe. You know, there's 10,000 of them, they're all slightly different. So, having a board ape gives you the intellectual property rights to use that unique image. No one else has the rights to use it. And in this case, uh, the owner of one said ape has opened a fast food restaurant in Los Angeles where lots of people who are into NFTs live. And they have branded this burger joint with this ape imagery. And also they were accepting cryptocurrency in payment for said uh, burgers for about the first few months and then they had to stop that because the volatility was just too much. And if a, a cryptocurrency is dropping 70% in value between one day and the next, obviously it's quite tricky to accept it as currency. But my point is you can make real money <laughs> by renting your NFT out, if it's a popular one, to a brand, as has happened, for example, with Adidas as is happening here uh, with this particular board ape and the restaurant's name is Bored and Hungry. And I'll just show you what some of the big brands are doing in the metaverse. Uh, this is in Roblox and of course Nike would be early adopters. We turn the sound down but essentially this is saying you get your own little space within this metaverse and it's essentially a replication of their Oregon HQ. It's got all the same facilities that Nike has in its HQ in Oregon. Um, you would basically have the option to go to the Nike store, try on digital sneakers, buy them of course, and in many cases you can also purchase a digital item of apparel and then have the real one made. Uh, so there's often that kind of collaboration with the real world. But this just gives you an idea of a sort of Robloxy type um, interface. But what is interesting with Nike is they have taken this a step beyond most others in that they've brought that metaverse world 
into their physical store, again, with the use of augmented reality that we talked about earlier, where you look through the screen of your smartphone to see a layer of other reality. In this case, you use Snapchat. Um, and this is in their physical store in New York, in the kids area, where you would see the metaverse world laid over the physical retail space and play games that you can play in the metaverse in the store. So that's something that I think we will expect to see more of in future. And you can imagine why luxury fashion is getting quite interested in this whole area, because as we see here with the Ada uh, luxury marketplace, you can create your own avatar, which looks like you, all gorgeous, uh, but still looking like you, um, and you can get your own posh changing room, your own studio area, you can furnish it as you like, you can invite your friends over. Um, typically, a, an item on Ada, a popular item of digital fashion, might get tried on 350,000 times by the avatars visiting the space for free. And then they can buy those items digitally for micro amounts, or they can buy the real items from Dior or Gucci for macro amounts. So it's a democratizing way for a brand with very luxury oriented products that maybe young people don't easily get their hands on. It's a way to get those young people to experience those products and perhaps aspire to them for the future. And we're also seeing these very interesting ways to engage NFTs, non-fungible tokens, um, for things like loyalty, uh, memberships, uh, even fundraising. And this is Bella Hadid, uh, the supermodel. And she has obviously lots of online followers. One assumes mostly quite young people. Um, so she has created 11,111. NFTs, it usually seems to be 10,000, but she's done something slightly different. And of those, 10% are dropped or made available online in each of 10 cities. Now, what those uh, NFTs are, they are um, video uh, digital art of her body and face that has been scanned, but is upgraded into a sort of cyborg type uh, character as we here, see here, and that's why it's called Cybella. There are half a million people on the waiting list to buy these NFTs. So these NFTs pass both as a piece of art, a collectible, but also a membership um, mechanic. Because if you have the NFT, you are invited onto a private Discord which means a sort of messaging, um, conversational video uh, communication app that you only get access to if you have the NFT. And of course she's on there and she might be talking to you, the real person, and she'll do it two times a week, like Wednesdays and Saturdays. So it doesn't take, take over her life completely. And she will also make available to those NFT holders exclusive invites to, you know, her luxury, villa in the metaverse and also invite them uh, her nft followers into real events in the real cities so having those nfts are potentially going to be very hot property and don't forget if you own an nft you can always sell it you buy it you sell it you might sell it for less you might sell it for more so people are buying nfts obviously in the hope of accumulating wealth uh, by selling them for more than they bought them. Now, the biggest issue with all of this, the biggest philosophical issue that I think, you know, many people are very interested in and grappling, grappling with is the whole concept of deleveraging our existing model, <laughs> no less than um, decentralization actually challenging the current model of our internet, the way we do business, e-commerce, banking. Um, and that's why China, for example, has banned it. 
because obviously it takes power out of traditional institutions. And of course, there will be regulation and nobody knows yet where this will end up. But right now we are still absolutely at the Wild West, pre-regulation. And that's why people are making large sums of money in this early Wild West. But from our point of view, we can certainly observe some interesting new business models. Uh, for example, the shovel sellers are probably going to make the most money. <laughs> the people who sell legal advice, accounting advice, etc., are opening offices in the metaverse. They're buying land, building their offices for people to come and get advice on how to uh, how to do HR, employment contracts. How do you pay staff you're employing in the metaverse? Nobody really knows this yet, and everybody's going to need help. So you go to PwC in the sandbox, or you might go to a metaverse branch of your existing bank, which again is the case in South Korea. This is a proper, regular, respectable bank open, opening its branches in the metaverse, in this case in SciWorld, which half the population is using typically in South Korea. And in there, you can learn about their services, you can deposit in-game currency, watch it grow with interest, take it out, buy more stuff with it. Um, it will fluctuate uh, based on real world value. And of course, we have the new startups rushing in um, to create a new thing that's never existed before, metaverse first banks. Um, now, of course, those of you who are probably far more knowledgeable about cryptocurrency than me know that whilst it is a very uh, volatile and dangerous thing, if you don't know what you're doing, it is also very exciting because you become the bank. You lend your money to multiple other people and you get the interest, not the bank. Um, and they, will, they are claiming that if and when they get their banking license in 2025, they, for example, will, will allow you to use your metaverse land as loan collateral or real loans. They will have, they claim, virtual credit cards in partnership with Visa, MasterCard, Apple, Google Pay. So we're talking about real money here, not just for use in the metaverse. And whilst not everyone yet feels that they understand how to hold or use cryptocurrency, and you certainly can't um, use it in most shops, although you can in Gucci's flagship stores in America, um, we're seeing some platforms here uh, that are starting to make that easy for the regular consumer. So Lolly is a rewards site and browser uh, extension that you partner up with uh, as a user. And then when you use products and services that they have partnered with, you get up to 30% cash back, but you get it in Bitcoin into your account. And then you watch it <laughs> in its volatile way, go up or down, but it makes cash back rather more interesting. And we see also crowdfunding with NFTs. So this is uh, the fly fish club it doesn't exist yet it's opening next year in new york um, you will only be able to go to this private club if you have bought their nfts two different levels of kind of upper and, mid and middle kind of membership um, and then once it opens you will be able to go with however many people you've booked your table for so you plus three others if it's a table for four uh, you will pay with card or cash as per usual when you're in there. But what's interesting here is you can also sell your NFT if you get bored with that club, or you can rent it out as an income generating asset while you're not using it when you're in the Hamptons or away from New York. And if this becomes really popular and it is backed by some of the top chefs in America, then of course, it may go up in value. You may be able to sell it as a membership for more than you bought it. So 
looking again at the decentralization idea, which was, <laughs> and, and the whole kind of cryptocurrency blockchain revolution that was until recently booming, but is still, I think, very interesting. We can definitely see some interesting new business models based on things like anonymity, ownership, and democracy. Albeit, we are currently, as I've mentioned, pre-regulation, which will no doubt come. So, for example, in San Francisco, you can spend up between $1,000 and $10,000 to acquire a flower, which is what it's called, in the pollen system, uh, to create a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized mobile phone network. So, essentially, you're tapping into your Wi-Fi and you're broadcasting uh, a signal from your balcony where you have a signal booster. And that will spread to within a mile's radius and other people in your neighborhood can choose to be on the pollen network. And you, the broadcaster or the signal provider, uh, will be paid in cryptocurrency depending on how many people in your neighborhood sign up, how strong your signal is, and so on and so forth. And the reason that people want these new kinds of decentralized mobile phone networks is that there's no tracking data, no logging data, no selling data. You are not being used as a data source. It is private. And also I mentioned earlier that one of the reasons young people are so excited about the opportunities in the metaverse is that they can make money with their own creativity. So the Fabricant Studio is a digital fashion atelier in the Netherlands, where they go to uh, proper fashion designers to create templates of fashion for your digital avatar. And then you, the ordinary person sitting at home, can customize those templates with color and texture and unique bits and pieces that's easy for you to program. And then you can sell them to anyone else who wants to use them. And then you share the reward uh, uh, across the people who created the intellectual property. So the fabricant, the designer, and the consumer creator. So again, regular people can see ways who are creative of actually selling intellectual property that they have themselves created. And when we come to the democracy question, which is obviously, you know, normally the, above the pay grade of uh, a specialist in retail. But, you know, for us, actually, we, we look at all of these kinds of things um, for all sorts of different reasons. There is an island uh, that is essentially in the area of Vanuatu in the Pacific that was previously unoccupied, but occupiable. And they have uh, decided to make 21,000 citizenship NFTs available, which come with land. And they are currently in the process of developing uh, the project where they will sell those citizenship NFTs. And then crypto entrepreneur types will in theory buy in, they will buy land, and then one of the top architects in the US, I mean, these guys are, sorry, I think they're in Hong Kong. These guys are top architects you will have to place only these modular style of buildings on your land. But you won't have to go to the island, Satoshi, in order to choose your plot and see the view and choose your configuration of buildings. And you can build an enormous complex if you want, just building these building blocks, because within their metaverse, you will be able to walk around this island and see exactly the view that you will have out of your bedroom window if you choose a particular plot and stay there uh, for a time. And then within that also, you will have a voting right on the future of the island. It is a new form potentially of democracy. It's early days, it's not actually fully up and running yet, but there's these kinds of things going on all over the world. And some very serious people, as you can see, this is uh, uh, Lindsay McKinnery, the Global Head of Technology and Innovation at AB InBev, obviously big drinks company. And she says the future of sports, media and entertainment is virtual. 
and obviously she's probably thinking about her younger audience, but she says two and a half billion people are already participating in the virtual economy. And this is the direction the world's moving in. There's no question in her mind that brands need to find places to be in the virtual world uh, in parallel to where they are in the real world. So just to sum up some of these big differences between Web 2, where we are now, and Web 3, where we may be going with the metaverse. In Web 2, it is centralized. It's owned by a small number of very large tech companies that we all know um, who might turn you off. If you behave badly, you might deserve it. <laughs> I'm not saying that you wouldn't. But um, in Web 3, you can't be turned off because no one owns it. It is scattered across hundreds of thousands or millions of computers. Um, there is no cutting anyone out. There is no censorship in the sense that we have in today's web. In web 2.0, um, obviously you sell your data or you don't sell it, you give it away in exchange for services like Google or Amazon, etc. And up until recently, we didn't have much choice in this matter. But obviously in Web3, uh, your personal data is not monetized. It cannot be in the same way because that's not the way Web3 works. It is fundamentally decentralized. And do you remember when there was that big argument with Amazon and Visa and they weren't going to accept Visa payments anymore? Because in Web2.0, we have intermediaries that we need in order to make payments. We have third parties, but if you move to crypto, then you don't need those interim third parties. You are your own bank and no one um, can cut you off and you can earn interest, for example, on all the people that you lend money to. And that is me done, thank you very much. Well, that's, that's great. And thank you very much Dave, for a very illuminating uh, talk. It just reminded me of, of uh, you know, the beginning of this uh, sort of session where people were still really questioning the, the explosion of the internet 1.0. And uh, we've come 20 years on, and we're actually on the next cusp of something very different, potentially. So uh, thank you very much for a very, very enlightening uh, talk. So thank you very much. I'm sure there will be loads of questions. I have loads of questions. Apart from the statement I would like to make, I would like to buy a product at the Toshi Islands. I think that sounds brilliant. Does anybody, let's start with the room, because I need to enable people online to be sure that I mute themselves first. So anybody in the room who would like to ask a question? Vicky, if you can just speak directly into it, that would be really helpful. Uh, this is what it's How do the big players like Google, Amazon, etc., how are they protecting themselves or taking part in the new metaverse? Well, as you probably know, Facebook is no longer Facebook, it's now Meta. So they are putting all their eggs in the metaverse basket, you could say. Um, Mark Zuckerberg believes that it is going to be the new form of internet and that we will experience it predominantly in three dimensions in the future using virtual reality. But don't forget, he's not thinking of great big clunky uh, headsets where you can't see where you're going and you're tripping over the sofa and they get sweaty and, you know, give you sort of uh, nausea and so on. He's thinking of Ray-Bans where you're wearing normal fitting glasses and through those regular glasses, you can access the metaverse in three dimensions or in mixed reality where you can also see what you're uh, experiencing in the real world and have layer of augmented reality on top. That is the game changer. When and if that happens and if they are, can have sufficient battery power and if they don't make people sick and if you can put your own prescription lenses in. And of course you can do that already with Ray-Bans um, that have partnered with Meta for essentially taking videos and taking calls and so on. I mean, we're already quite close um, to normal glasses that you wear where you can start to get information coming in 
that's when we tip from web two into full web three, I suspect is what he's thinking. So they're all pretty worried, I suspect, about the deleveraging because uh, you know, the fundamental model on which uh, their businesses are built will be substantially undermined by decentralization. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have an auxiliary question myself, and that is uh, the metaverse really depends on the customer experience. And as Vicky already mentioned, there is the idea of uh, you know, the interface that I have to train on others have, and what I see in the way that example is a good one. But also the experience I have in terms of what I see when I'm in the metaverse. At the moment, apart from better, where it looks actually more or less of CGI related and quite lifelike, in most other areas, you see the characters floating around doing things in the sort of, in the sort of fancy land. And I think how long do you think it will be for CGI and like the gaming industry will get involved to actually create an environment which is more or less distinguishing from, from the real world? I think there are already worlds which are photorealistic. Um, they, uh, there are also things like malls which are being built, which are photorealistic. And actually, I think the problem with that is when you have a more anime version, a cartoon type version, in a way that is a better expression of what the metaverse represents, because why would you necessarily stick with all the rules of gravity and the real world? I mean, the advantage of the metaverse is you can go beyond the rules of the real world. And, you know, even as you saw with the, you know, Facebook uh, Horizons workroom, meta, sorry, uh, they've chosen not to make it photorealistic. They could have put real pictures of, you know, forests and mountains out the window, and birds tweeting and stuff, but they've chosen not to because they think you have more creative opportunities not in a photorealistic way. But Microsoft Mesh are going photorealistic in the end. They claim that for their enterprise workroom, you will eventually be able to just scan yourself with your LiDAR phone, which is currently an iPhone 12 or up, uh, and you will get a photorealistic avatar of yourself for your workroom uh, representation, three-dimensional, fully photorealistic. So there are already all aspects along that graduation. And you can Photoshop yourself afterwards to make yourself better, no doubt. And uh, I think for me, it's, it's, if the world looks good, I can do more in the real look of the world than I can do physically. That could be a game changer. So that's interesting. And don't forget, yeah. people like the idea of not being themselves and having perhaps multiple avatars. Some are male, some are female, yeah. some might be a pink dragon, some might be a fighter warrior. Yeah. You know, it's about experience expressing different identities yeah, as well. Good. Anybody else in the, in the room over there? I'm going to work out how to frame this question, so forgive me. You finished by saying this is essentially decentralized. The internet started off saying it was very easy like that. Um, and then it the extended up very much beyond like that because you know, Google, Facebook um, have become dominant players. I think they've done it not in well the moment places. They provide the books so that other people can attach to, to their bit on the internet. Um, um, so are we seeing the degree of virtual world? Are you seeing in the faces? Do you take your piece of land that you've built in Fortnite and no. put it into animal crossing? No, exactly that point is very important. They are not interoperable yet. And that's another major barrier to the metaverse tipping into being you know acceptable yeah. for general use because they're not valuing no each you, individual one is very limited yeah you have to have a collective yeah you have to different avatar for each one pay land for different land money for different land in each one why would you invest in one it might fail 
yes, that is the big problem within at the moment is that there are so many metaverses and some of them are owned by a company like the, the centralized ones like Roblox or Minecraft. Um, so you, if that company goes bust and you've spent a lot of money in that world creating an ex experience, your money goes down the drain, presumably. But on the upside, if, it's, if it is a more centralized world, then there are rules and people are more protected from bad actors. So, you know, nobody knows where the balance will end up being. And the decentralized potential future metaverse with interoperable worlds is a fiction. Nobody knows if that will win out. It's just a possibility at this stage. Yeah. It seems a bit hopeful given the way you know, the world has worked for hundreds of years. It tends to get centralized. Except the blockchain is that new kind of potential uh, game changer for yeah. non singular ownership. Okay, plenty more questions, hopefully, in the room. No, nothing yet. Well, I go and ask one question in the chat room, which is. What risks do you see in its development in the next five years? Well, we're already seeing um, some of those, <laughs> possibly unkindly call them the shovel sellers, the support uh, services, which are of course essential, um, who are perhaps buying land, you know, like PwC, and we're seeing it with HR companies and legal companies. There are already some where they're reporting that they bought a plot of land in a metaverse for say $25,000. Uh, a few months ago, and you look up what they paid in Ethereum, and it's now worth ten thousand dollars. So there's already the potential for you know spending a lot of money that then is declining in in its value because of that volatility of cryptocurrency. So that's a major you know picking the right one, um, buying land in the right place. I mean, if you buy land uh, next to Snoop Dogg in the sandbox, <laughs> it, you might pay $450,000 because you're next to a celebrity who's very active in that world. Uh, whereas a normal piece of land in a normal part of the sandbox might be between, you know, two and a half and $10,000. So who you're next to and where you pick is important but it's also a bit of a lottery. Thank you for that. It's very easy. Two and a half to ten thousand dollars. It's not small price for the virtual world. But it's, it's obviously it has obviously got some momentum. The other thing is what will this do to relationships between people? So this is a this is a very personal thing. Yes, I mean, you know, if you were a psychologist or a child psychologist, you probably are very worried about this because obviously young people already spend too much time not in the real world and of course that is going to be a worry but i also can't help thinking about the positive so if you are for example um in your vr headset which might be a regular pair of glasses and you're at a physics lesson being given by the world's most engaging physics teacher and you feel as though you're really there and you're interacting with all the other kids that are also there that is a much more engaging educational uh, experience than perhaps what's available to those kids now. So I think we have to look at what are the good potential outcomes for this. And then we need to legislate or be sensible grown ups uh, in order to try and mitigate the negatives. Okay. We do have one more, I think, here in the room. Again, if you just speak directly into it. Just something on what you said, really. Um, who actually places that interface? Do we need to know? Who we make sure that this is Well, at the moment, uh, nobody, <laughs> because it is the Wild West and it's so new that uh, legislation has not caught up. Governments have not caught up, except for China, which is ahead and has banned it and has a metaverse council. Um, to control it in its uh, Belt and Road Initiative outside of China. So, but then that is an authoritarian regime and not something that probably elsewhere would like to emulate. Um, so, of course, every government is working on 
how they think this should uh, be restricted and controlled. Um, and legislation is always, of course, very slow and always behind the innovators and the entrepreneurs in the digital space. So at the moment, outside of China, I would say nobody yet, but it will come, I suspect. Okay. Uh, ultimately, the big uh, uh, company in the world is about brand building and revenue growth. So, if you see someone like a Nike, let's say one day having both virtual sales revenues and physical sales revenues, and ultimately, obviously, if the revenue doesn't grow, it will ultimately be, be abandoned by a large new uh, yes, of course. Um, they are starting to consider the possibility that the metaverse might be the third major retail channel. So we have obviously offline first, then online, and now on the blockchain as the third channel, and that they will have to integrate those three channels instead of the two channels that they have at the moment. But yes, of course, um, they would give something the chop wasn't making money long term. But I think that a lot of big brands will probably invest quite considerably for the early stage to see where it goes. Okay. And who owns the data and who, who integrates the algorithms into the metaverse? Well, yeah, that's probably slightly above my pay grade because that's a sort of technical back end question. I mean, there are committees of knowledgeable people that are starting to get together to you know create standards and to try and move in the direction of interoperability um but well back end it's beyond me to be honest but, but presumably everything you do in the metaverse does get tracked well everything Somewhere. that's on the blockchain is transparent yes yeah. so everything you buy or sell in the form of an nft which is lodged on the blockchain is visible not who bought it, you personally are not identified as the buyer or the seller, but the fact that something sold for a certain price at a certain time is visible also to the tax man. <laughs> so we are starting to see companies setting up to help people manage their taxes uh, with regard to their cryptocurrency transactions internationally, because they realize, you know, something's going to catch up with them in the end. Um, but yes, that is one of those areas of complexity that we'll have to work out. Okay, so are there any more questions in the online audience? Anybody in the room? No, I think it's stunned them all into silence. <laughs> uh, I think it's very difficult to, to, to contemplate that kind of reality that we might all be inhabiting in the next 10, 15 years. Uh, so maybe we, it's time to call it a day then. Uh, and to give a case of a big round of applause. <laughs>